uh, all morning to you, depending on uh, where you're joining us from. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on today's webinar. Well, we'll be sharing with you results from our survey of payroll workers and managers across Canada. Um, and uh, we're doing this in conjunction with the Canadian Payroll Association. By way of uh, introduction to me, I'm Andy Robling. I've been with Hayes for uh, just over 25 years, um, starting in uh, accounting and finance in, in the UK. And uh, I moved to Canada in 2013. I'm currently responsible for uh, managing uh, our client relationships um, across Canada. Um, we place payroll professionals with a, a range of clients. Um, so this is a key area of interest and also um, expertise for Hayes. My contact information is here on the slide and you're more than welcome to contact me if you have any questions arising from this presentation. Um, if we have time uh, at the end, um, uh, we'll try and pick up some questions. So um, if, um, if anyone wants to contact us, um, please do so and we'll try and pick them up at the end. Uh, joining us uh, today is uh, Stephen Van Halstein, the Vice President of Education from the Canadian Payroll Association. Um, and uh, Stephen will be available to answer any questions we've got at the end of this presentation. So uh, welcome also to uh, Stephen. We'll begin uh, in just a moment um, with the, the headlines from our 2017 salary guide, and then we'll drill down into some of the key findings. However, um, just to kick things off, uh, a little bit of background on the, uh, the salary report itself. Um, this is the fourth report um, that we've, um, we've published. Um, so as well as the in-year data, uh, we're also in a pretty good position to look at uh, longer-term trends, um, which we will, uh, during the course of uh, this webinar, um, we've had a we had a very healthy response, um, as you can see um, from the numbers, and also uh, we cover a wide geography and and also a wide range of industries are represented in the report as well. So um, we like to think that there's uh, there is genuinely um, something uh, that any payroll professional can uh, pick out uh, for themselves, either as an employer. Um, also uh, as an employee as well. Um, a full copy of the report is available. Uh, you can order it from hayes.ca, um, and there's full details that will be available at the end of this webinar. So, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll start with headlines from the Hayes 2017 uh, Payroll Salary Guide, and then we'll drill down into them a little bit further. There, there is confidence uh, in the uh, payroll community, um, and uh, as well as there having been an increase in business activity um, from 2016, uh, there's also expected to be a further increase um, in the next year, I'd say in 2017, in the coming year. Um, however, um, despite there being confidence that there's going to be increased business activity, Hiring forecasts um, remain flat year on year, and, and we'll take a look at some of the challenges uh, that this increased workload um, or increased activity, um, uh, but flat hiring forecast um, may actually represent. Uh, salaries are, are rising um, uh, slowly, but they are rising. Um, however, um, half of the people that we surveyed said that they're either not being paid market rate or they're actually not sure what the market rate is. Um, and again, we'll look at this in a little bit more detail um, and see what kind of problems might occur as a result. The uh, survey um, also suggests that employers uh, may be missing out on opportunities to offer competitive benefits packages to both attain, attain uh, sorry, attract rather, and retain top payroll professionals. Um, so again, it's a theme that we'll look at as we dive a little bit more into the detail. So we're going to start with a uh, market overview. 
Um, and, uh, and as I said, we've been running this survey now for four years, so we're able to look not just at the year ahead, but also uh, look at the trends over the last, uh, the last four years. So we start with business activity, um, and uh, you can see uh, the employers are starting to see a uh, pickup um, in activity, um, and uh, that's, that's expected to increase further during the course of the year. Now, an increase in activity um, is um, an indicator of increased workload for the payroll profession, and this could be through increased volumes from business expansion or acquisition or uh, projects such as um, systems implementation. But whatever the reason, the, uh, the, the forecast is looking like there is uh, confidence in an increase in activity. So dark blue uh, is the proportion of activity increase. Um, the, uh, the striped line um, is the predicted increase, and the, uh, the dark blue is actual results. Um, purple is uh, remain the same, and light blue is decreasing activity. Um, so looking back, you can see that respondents over the years have been pretty good at predicting increasing activity levels, with the exception of 2015, which is when we saw the oil and gas downturn affect um, much of Canada, and Alberta specifically, but uh, having an impact upon the whole, uh, the whole economy in some, some degree. But we now have 58% of people this year saying they expect activity to uh, increase. Um, and based on past consistency, with the exception of um, uh, the um, oil and gas downturn, I think we could expect to see 55 to 60% of uh, payroll teams increasing activity over the course of the next year, over the course of the next 12 months. So that's good. Uh, it's good news. Um, so we can see that increase there. Um, next, we look at headcount, and the colours are the same here. So we've got a, the increase uh, in um, is dark blue, remain the same as purple, and decrease um, is light blue. So we can see that um, year on year that most payroll teams um, have actually been staying uh, staying the same size. So. Despite more than half of payroll hiring managers saying they would uh, that they'd be expecting an increase in activity, there's only 12% uh, who are expecting uh, to increase headcount as well. So that means that you and your teams are quite likely to to be busier, um, but not necessarily uh, adding headcount to handle uh, the increase in activity. So. Sometimes this is manageable um, if you're looking at improvements um, in, uh, in technology, introduction of uh, new software. But if you are managing a team, uh, we would suggest that you keep an eye on the workload to make sure that uh, everyone is able to manage their tasks and the priorities. Often, uh, an increase in workload um, can be met not only through use of technology, but also through use of temporary staff or contractors. So we're going to take a look at what's been forecast there next. So looking at uh, use of temporary workers uh, in our market update, again, dark blue is increased, purple is remain the same, uh, and, uh, and light blue um, is, uh, is decreased. The grey at the end is uh, those who say they don't actually use uh, temporary workers. So you can see that's just over, over half of the employees who survey so that uh, they don't use temporary work as a resource, but that leaves about 45% who, who do. Um, and most say they will keep their temporary workforce at the same level lot as last year. And this, been, this has been very consistent over the past four years. So again, we could be looking at an increase in workload with no permanent or uh, additional temporary resources. Um, and this can have a detrimental, detrimental impact on staff morale and consequently staff turnover. So it's well worth line managers being aware of looming uh, retention issues. We look now at uh, compensation trends. So what can we expect from salary levels for the coming year? Um, this is the, the salary increase trend. Uh, in dark blue uh, are those companies that uh, did not 
uh, or are not forecasted, have not increased salaries over the last few years, or not forecasting. Um, uh, and you can see actually that this has increased um, every year for the uh, for the last three years. Um, uh, however, um, it looks like this is expected to drop again next year. So um, actually, um, we're looking at fewer companies um, having uh, no increases. Uh, most payroll workers uh, did receive a pay increase in 2016, but the majority of these increases were 3% or less. Looking ahead, the salary predictions are actually in line with the expectations of increased business activity, um, with fewer respondents, as I said, predicting zero increases. And there are a few more expecting to increase salaries by more than 3%. It's possible uh, that extra workload uh, will be offset by salary increases. Um, however, the salary increases may also be in part uh, to employers' desire to be more competitive, um, which we'll come on to look at uh, in just a moment. Worth noting, um, as we uh, conclude this part on salaries, that certified payroll professionals um, earn up to 20% more um, in the marketplace, um, so very well worth, uh, well worth considering. So looking at um, salary expectations, um, you can see that uh, only 47% uh, of payroll professionals think their compensation package is competitive. Um, and it's quite interesting here that we've got almost, um, uh, well, just over one in five um, saying that they don't know um, what the market rate, so they're unsure of whether their, um, their package is competitive or not. And that's, that's quite, a high, uh, quite a high figure. Um, so I, I would suggest that if that, is, if, if that is you, if you're one of the people who are, are not sure whether you're being, uh, you're being paid market rate, um, please do uh, request our salary guide. Um, find out what your peers are earning um, and uh, whether um, you, if you're below market expectation, whether that's uh, a question of um, uh, uh, certification or perhaps specialising, um, or um, maybe um, the, your current employer um, is not looking to keep up um, with market rates on, on compensation, um, that, uh, that may consider you to lead, uh, lead you to consider um, career options. What's interesting um, following that um, is the fact um, that uh, just half, um, what's uh, interesting following the fact that um, just about half of payroll positions think they've been paid market rate, is employers say they do focus on the compensation as their main recruitment tool. So that's great. That's great if people uh, do know um, uh, whether they're, um, what market rate is, um, um, but um, it could be that compensation is just seen as easy and obvious answer to recruitment challenges um, as opposed to something um, you're using strategically to get the talent you want in the market. Because if you've got about half of your professional population who are either not being competitive uh, or not uh, being paid competitively and 22% are unsure, um, with employers saying they uh, the number one um, uh, uh, factor that they use to combat um, uh, recruitment issues is compensation. Um, there's obviously uh, some kind of mismatch uh, going on there, and we'll talk about this more in a moment as well. So recruitment and retention. Um, the, the headline here is that skill shortages um, are still affecting the payroll function. And this is actually a trend uh, across um, a number of disciplines uh, nationally. Um, so, uh, so payroll is um, it's certainly not alone. Um, although uh, the actual number of employers saying there is a skill shortage um, is actually uh, higher than um, than in most other disciplines. So, I see the most employers, 75%, um, say that uh, skill shortage um, is an issue um, that affects. Uh, the function. We we ask specifically what level uh, employers were struggling um, uh, to find most of, and 43% um, said that they can't easily find um, intermediate to mid-level uh, payroll workers. 
Um, unfortunately, that's um, again going back to uh, other disciplines. That that's actually a common response um, across uh, a number of disciplines. There, there's a knowledge gap um, between senior and junior professionals, um, which is uh, which is challenging uh, quite a lot of employers. Um, however, um, it appears um, that it's not just skills um, that um, are the isn't skills actually that are the biggest concern when it comes to attracting the best payroll talent. So the factor, um, but, uh, but not necessarily uh, the biggest factor. So we asked employers what their biggest recruitment challenge was, um, and you can see that uh, the dark uh, blue segment here, um, so the largest section at 35%, um, is actually um, personality fit. Um, and that's, again, uh, reflecting on uh, on other disciplines, um, that's actually um, pretty much always the top answer uh, when we ask this. Um, so, so both employers and professionals say that fit is the biggest reason um, either for letting people go or um, if you're a payroll professional, um, actually leaving, uh, leaving your job. Uh, we've looked at this issue of fit um, in a lot more detail um, in a series uh, of uh, reports um, called the Fit Series, and those are also available on Hayes.ca um, if you'd like to request copies. It's just interesting on this slide that the combined totals of credentials, compliance knowledge, and systems experience does add up to more than fit. Um, so both hard and soft skills are necessarily vital components for the right hire. However, if the person doesn't fit your business culture, you're not likely to be making a successful hire. Uh, similarly, or conversely, if the business culture isn't right for you, uh, then do you really want to be making that career move? So good candidates are hard to find, um, but even if um, they can track down good people, are employers doing enough to successfully hire them? So going back to the question of compensation um, over other benefits, um, we saw that 47% of employees uh, said they were um, paid competitively, um, and employers said that compensation was the number one recruitment tool. Um, however, this chart shows um, how job seekers uh, weigh up the job offer, um, and looking at the data, um, there's, there's a couple of areas where um, employers and payroll professionals do have different expectations. So if your main recruitment tool uh, is, uh, is compensation, that does actually align um, with the top candidate priority, so all good there. However, if we look at the rest of this chart, everything after, I think to the right of the dark blue squares uh, um, is other factors. Um, and so more than two thirds of uh, people's um, decision um, on whether to accept a job um, are not actually uh, related um, to compensation. Um, in fact, after salary, uh, work-life balance um, is uh, the single biggest priority, um, and that's followed by benefits. And if you take both these factors together, they do outweigh compensation, which is not to say that um, you know, people aren't uh, going to be looking at, uh, at salary However, when we talked earlier about managing workload, um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, challenge with, uh, with heavy workloads, um, which is you know, your payroll team feels that they have to work extra hours or the work stress is affecting their home life and they're looking for a role that will actually give them um, a little bit more balance. Um, so this becomes not just a recruitment issue, um, but also a retention issue um, here as well. Um, but I think the, uh, as far as recruitment is concerned, uh, the current moral is that um, you know, meeting market rate um, is, is important um, if you can do it. Um, but if that's only part of your total offer, uh, if that's only part of your total offer you're paying attention to, then you are potentially going to lose out uh, on the best candidates um, who are looking for um, a, a balance between compensation and, uh, and other factors. And also, as a job seeker, um, don't forget um, when uh, when the opportunity presents itself uh, to 
negotiating a job offer to negotiate beyond uh, the salary? Um, do you want to be able to work from home twice a week or to be entitled to uh, time off in lieu? Um, and if that is the case, um, then we recommend you ask for it um, because uh, you are working in a competitive uh, market and uh, you know, sometimes those benefits can improve your quality of life more than a 2% pay increase uh, and, uh, and employers are encouraged uh, to consider those factors um, as much as compensation when it comes to recruitment. We also look uh, at the factors impacting on retention and necessarily um, some of the, these, are, these are similar factors uh, to the ones that people consider um, when they're looking to take a job um, in the first place. But when we look specifically at retention, then uh, the, the number one um, retention challenge for employers um, is compensation um, or uh, their ability to pay a competitive uh, salary. However, if 31% of employees don't think they're being paid market rate and 22% are unsure, um, giving us that figure in the bottom left-hand corner of uh, 53%. Uh, it would appear that employers are going to struggle to improve retention just by using compensation. Um, the, the second biggest challenge um, impacting on, on uh, retention was career progression. Um, and, uh, and we see from the survey that 74% uh, of, of employees uh, feel that moving ahead in their careers is important to them. So if you're unable to provide some degree of development in people's careers, this is likely to be creating more retention pressure. Um, this is not something that you can necessarily, even if you're able to, uh, throw money at through compensation. Uh, there is a genuine desire for payroll professionals to grow within their careers, uh, and this could be through attaining a more senior position, or as we're finding, uh, the opportunity to develop new skills, to have training made available to them, to work on different projects, uh, becoming an increasing part of that mix of career progression and career development. Um, so as I said, we, uh, we're encouraging employers uh, to look uh, very seriously at the opportunities that they're giving to their staff if they want to be able to hold on to them. Finally, uh, we'll take a look at uh, benefits trends. So what we have here, um, so uh, two tables here. Um, on the, the left, um, uh, in the, the light, uh, the light blue-headed table, uh, are the five most commonly offered benefits uh, by employers. And you've got all your um, stuff you would expect in here, you've got health and dental, um, insurance, training, um, uh, great to see that in the, uh, the top there, and also uh, pension support. So th this is what most employers are offering. And on the right is uh, what candidates want. Uh, so what, what they rate as the single most important benefit to them. Now, there is alignment here. Um, you've got uh, health and dental, um, and you've got pension matching. Um, so very important to, uh, to candidates. Um, but as you can see here, it builds on what, uh, what I was saying previously. There is, a, there is a gap between expectation and offering uh, around uh, flexible work hours, for example, and also the ability uh, to work from home. Um, benefits that support work-life balance, which we know uh, from the, uh, the survey is very important to uh, payroll professionals. Um, and, and with technology, um, these kind of benefits are also getting easier or should be getting easier um, and easier to, uh, to offer businesses. Um, so benefits uh, like this are an important uh, differentiator. Um, when we crunch numbers, we see that two-thirds of employers offer at least two of the top rated uh, the top rated benefits on the uh, on the right hand side that's that's pretty good um, but obviously if you're one of the other 31 percent uh, of employers then um, you may want to uh, take notes and think well, what more could we be doing here looking specifically at those uh, top 
to benefits, some um, health and dental plus pension matching, 61% um, off of both of those. Um, but only 24% um, offer all five of the top rated benefits. So if you're offering two, consider offering a third because that's the kind of thing that is, uh, is going to set you apart um, from your competitors beyond just the salary level. And obviously if you can offer all five, then you should be working as hard as you can to actively promote the fact that you offer those benefits as a way of attracting the best talent in the market. So that's the those are the findings from the report. That's um, that's everything we wanted to uh, to cover today. As I said, the uh, the full report um, is available on request, uh, and uh, uh, once you've ordered a copy, if there's any follow-up questions from that, uh, then feel free to contact us. So we're just going to leave you with our um, key findings. Uh, from the report and also uh, recommendations. So um, the skill shortage highlights to us or the, what the skill shortage means is that employers are struggling to find candidates with the right combination of skills, training and experience. However, fit uh, is more important than any one of those factors uh, taken together. Um, We've looked at the fact that employers and payroll professionals may have mismatched priorities when it comes to uh, benefits that have been offered um, in addition to compensation um, and also uh, career progression. Um, career, career, career progression may be flat in certain areas within payroll, but payroll professionals are still ambitious. Um, and uh, again, uh, this is a point that we've expanded on in, uh, in other webinars when we talked about the fact that career progression uh, for ambitious professionals is in part uh, about uh, promotion through a hierarchy, but it's also in part, and perhaps more importantly, about the opportunity to continue developing uh, skills and, uh, and the opportunity to get exposed to different areas of a business. Um, also, um, going back to that point, benefits uh, may be a missed opportunity for employers to stand out in the marketplace to top payroll professionals. So on recommendations, so uh, some for employers and some also for, for job seekers. So it's a, a competitive market for skills. Um, so we encourage employers uh, to build their networks to be able to find great candidates. The, the very best people may be open to a career move, but not necessarily actively looking for a move. So if you can build your network of potential employees, you're always going to be more competitive when it comes to attracting the best talent. However, you also need to have a good offering to your employees, and this should include career growth, not only to attract the best people, um, but also to retain your top talent. Um, and offering uh, career growth and professional development to retain uh, the top talent um, is important, um, but we're also encouraging um, employers to uh, develop their own staff, um, not necessarily through hiring just the skill set, but also hiring for fit, um, because we've seen that the biggest challenge, uh, the recruitment challenge that employers are facing is actually finding the right fit. Um, so it's finding people who fit into your culture and have perhaps got the right attitude, um, and uh, and you can you can take the opportunity to get the person who fits your business and as I said train them uh, to actually do the job. And then if we look at job seekers, um, it's very important that you know uh, what uh, employers want and that you demonstrate how you fit uh, those requirements um, and. As I said, it, it's not just about fitting the, the technical skills, um, but it's also about assessing uh, whether um, you are a right fit for that company culture, but also remembering that it's a competitive market um, and it's as important uh, that that company um, is a good fit for you um, and that they've actually got something uh, to offer you um, apart from just the, the uh, job and the compensation. And, we talked about the, the 
opportunity to negotiate beyond base compensation um, to get the benefits and perhaps also the work environment um, that's right for you. Um, and as much as we encourage employers to develop uh, their own network to find great candidates, we also uh, encourage professionals to invest in building your own network um, and, uh, and look at how you can develop your career through um, industry groups. Um, the, the fact is that you're as likely to find your next career move, move through a contact at the Canadian Payroll Association as you are um, to actually find it by um, finding a job on Indeed. So that's uh, the uh, end of the key messages we wanted to share today. So uh, thank you all very much for uh, dialing in and listening. Um, I certainly hope you found uh, the information that we shared uh, useful. Um, we we have got a, a couple of minutes left, um, and uh, I'm open to uh, we can open this up to any questions. So. Um, if you haven't done so already or you have a question, um, please uh, type it into uh, the uh, type it into the chat box um, and uh, we'll just take a moment and see whether we've got any questions. Um, as I said, also on the line today is Stephen uh, Van Alsting, the VP of Education at the Canadian Payroll Association. Um, as we're waiting just to see if there's any questions, um, if you'd like to request a copy of the full report, uh, please go to uh, hayes.ca forward slash payroll. Um, you will also have a recording of this webinar available uh, on our YouTube channel later today um, if uh, you were uh, unable to make the whole of this session. Um, and uh, my personal contact details uh, are there um, if there are any questions that you'd like to address to me personally. Okay. Uh, so let's see um, if we we have any questions. Uh, yeah, I think we've we've got one here for Stephen. Um, uh, do we have uh, do we have Stephen on the line now? Yes, I'm here, Andy. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing today? I'm great, thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be joining you. Before we get to the question, Andy, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to. Uh, to our members, many of whom are online, I think, uh, this afternoon uh, for completing the survey because obviously getting the results, getting a lot of responses uh, helps us make this, uh, this data relevant for, for obviously for Hayes, but obviously for the payroll community as well. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you. It's, uh, it's always interesting to watch the trends, uh, and certainly now that we've built up four years of information, uh, one of the positive things is that salaries continue to increase, but I think one of the things that we're noticing as well is um, the significance that employers particularly are placing on education and certification, and you can see that actually that's one of the things that employers offer a lot as a benefit, but it's also becoming, I think, uh, a, a minimum expectation of employers as well. And as a matter of fact, I was at a meeting last week in Montreal with uh, one of the schools that offers our program, Cégep marie Victorin. And they had indicated that um, they had heard that there was a consultant who had gone to apply for um, a consulting role at one of the um, municipalities, one of the large municipalities in the greater Montreal area. And um, one of the candidates who had 30 years of payroll experience was not even considered because as a minimum requirement they were looking for payroll certification. So, you know, it, it is good that, um, you know, obviously as we grow our numbers of certification, holders that the employer community is recognizing the significance of holding that certification as a differentiator for candidates who are coming forward for roles within payroll. So, um, and it, it seems that a lot of your survey information is reflecting that as well. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, no, no, thank, thank you for the observation, uh, Tim, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, one of the questions we have got, um, um, kind of leads on from there, if I can put this to you, Stephen, is uh, so the question says, um, I'm a, a PCP considering becoming a CPM, um, but I'm not sure if it's the right option. Uh, what are the advantages, and we may have answered some of this, but uh, specifically, what are the advantages and different opportunities for CPMs? Yeah, and uh, you, that's a great question, Andy. And, and one of the co one of the things that we noticed in the presentation that you provided us with were people were looking for opportunities for growth, 
uh, increased responsibility, the opportunity for promotion, and um, you know, part of part and parcel of that comes with obviously increased responsibility means a broader responsibility for perhaps a payroll staff uh, managing a payroll department. Right now, uh, we have close to 14,000 certification holders, and of those certification holders, obviously all of them are PCPs because you need to have the PCP certification before you can move on to the CPM certification, the Certified Payroll Manager certification, yep. but only 25% of our certification holders are CPMs. Now, our goal at the association is not to have all 100% of PCPs as a CPM. Our certification is not a logical progression. It is something that is, uh, you know, a conscious choice. Um, so if those that are considering moving on to becoming a CPM, obviously you have to have an intent to have uh, a supervisory or managerial uh, role desire within payroll. Um, but that being said, you know, the dynamic of Canada when we look uh, in comparison to the United States and, and the United Kingdom is that there are a lot more smaller organizations in Canada where payroll is being done by one individual or one individual has responsibility for payroll but is only doing payroll part of the time. As a matter of fact, in 50% of um, a case, in terms of those that are doing payroll, in 50% of situations they're doing payroll, less than half of their time is being spent right. on payroll. Right. So as a result of that, those that are considering moving on to become a CPM certainly have to have the desire to move into a managerial role, which obviously has a you know, different skill set, and our management uh, material reflects that. You're looking at things like project management, uh, you have to have decision-making responsibilities, um, change management responsibilities, employee management responsibilities, so that's a lot of what the certification reflects. But beyond that, the opportunities as well. There are only about 25% of organizations in Canada that have, a that have more than three people in the payroll role, therefore there's an opportunity for individuals to be managers. So you really have to consider that, again, you're competing for those jobs, they aren't as plentiful. What we're finding is people who uh, elevate themselves and get promoted up into those roles are not leaving, they're staying in those roles, so if there's not as much churn, then there's not as much opportunity for those individuals. So uh, again, for our members, you can certainly uh, go on to our, our um, Job Connect website to see the kinds of roles that are there. I know Hayes posts some of the roles that they have available there as well. And Hayes can probably reflect as well that, you know, those managerial roles are not as frequent and don't come up as frequently as payroll administrator or payroll yep. analyst or those kinds of roles. Yeah, no, that's certainly, uh, no, that's certainly um, uh, something that's a good observation and that's certainly something that uh, that we would agree with. I think uh, it, it's a balance in that, Stephen, between, uh, you know, being being job ready because you have the, uh, um, the, the accreditation, um, but also uh, being prepared to wait um, until the right opportunity comes up. Um, yeah. No, that's a really good point. Um, another question we have here, um, so this is, uh, this is from um, uh, an employer, um, says, uh, I find it relatively easy to find junior uh, candidates, um, um, and I, I don't mind training people up, but I'm struggling to find someone to replace a mid-level uh, person uh, who left recently and looking for suggestions on how they find uh, those people, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll pass it over to you in a second, Stephen. But our, our observation, just on that, um, would be that um, uh, it is it is a competitive market. We we looked at the uh, the mid level being where um, companies will struggle um, to uh, to recruit the right people, and um, we uh, we do a lot of work with businesses um, promoting their brand. Um, but prioritizing their brand as an employer um, rather than prioritizing their brand because of the products or services that they um, uh, that they either make or uh, or deliver. Um, so the question is, do people want to work with your company? Do they know what it's like uh, to to can they get a flavour of what it's like to be an, uh, one of your employees? Um, it's important that um, companies know what they actually do have to offer and they're able to articulate that um, as, a, as a value proposition, as employee value proposition. 
Um, but also we've looked at making things like work-life balance or flexible hours uh, available um, because these are the kind of things that people are actually looking for. Um, and if you can make them available, then make sure you're promoting them. Um, so uh, so that, that was uh, that, that's, um, uh, our view on that. Um, but Stephen, any, any thoughts on uh, on that? Uh, you know, whether areas that the association could help um, in terms of um, helping people with their recruitment challenges? Yeah, as I mentioned, Andy, we do have, of course, Job Connect, where organizations can post. Um, you know, and again, Hayes has used our, our posting because, again, you're getting obviously a very uh, engaged group uh, of our members who are professional members obviously are looking there if they're looking to move out of their current role and into another opportunity. The other thing that I might suggest is that, you know, internal cross-training I think is really important within a payroll department. So certainly if an organization is structured such that they have junior and intermediate and more senior roles, uh, doing that cross-training is important from, for, from the perspective being, of being able to promote within. It also enables an organization to have good uh, secession planning and, and backup coverage if somebody uh, goes on vacation or is absent and, and helps an organization to identify that talent pool that they can potentially draw on when those future uh, roles become available. We are finding that um, since we've put the experience requirement into our certification, that there is a lot of opportunity for organizations to hire those what we call PCP candidates, those individuals who have the educational program but don't have the actual experience and, and those individuals are really good candidates to move into those entry level type positions within organizations, but then it's you know, organizations can talent spot those individuals that they know have the capacity to grow with some experience, learn, and, you know, move through the ranks of an organization. So I think it's important um, on top of looking at those things like what people want and, and how organizations can attract through the benefits they provide, as you mentioned, Andy, there's those other kinds of things like uh, talent spotting internally that can be done as well that can be beneficial to an organization. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, that, that's an excellent point, um, seeing as we, one of the things that, um, that, we, that I mentioned in the webinar was that uh, the fit um, is, um, is the single biggest, uh, the single most important factor when it comes to hiring the right person. So if you've got somebody who's got the education and you determine that they've got the right uh, attitude um, and the right fit for your business, um, then uh, you're probably you're, you're most likely to be better off investing in the development of their skills um, uh, because you know that um, they're a, they're a good uh, they're likely to make it as a good employee. So I think that's a, a really good point there. Um, one more question, um, which touches on something that uh, that, that um, was uh, was in one of the slides. The question here says, I've been a payroll professional for 20 years. Um, have had four weeks vacation for over 15 years, um, new job provided three weeks, um, uh, and asked when is it okay to ask for four, um, and um, the, uh, um, the uh, I, I, I know our, our response, to, my response to that would be um, that um, that's something that should be dealt with as soon as you, uh, as part of the um, negotiation for the job. Um, which is not to say that somebody may not, an employer may not say, well, look, after three months we'll increase it, or after six months we'll increase your your, your vacation allowance. Um, but you know, you are working in a competitive market uh, for skills, um, and even taking uh, Stephen's point about the uh, um, the um, uh, limited number of senior roles, um, the fact is that even at the senior level, when jobs do become available, it's hard to find very good people. Um, so our advice um, would always be if, uh, if you're looking for um, a certain benefit um, look within the package, then um, you should be in a pretty good position to negotiate. Um, anything you want to add to that, Stephen? No, I think, uh, I think your advice is spot on, Andy. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much, Dean, for joining us. Um, pleasure to have you, as always. Um, and uh, thank uh, everyone who's joined us for this webinar. As I said, 
um, uh, the guide that is available um, to uh, request on hayes.ca forward slash payroll. Uh, there's also a copy of this webinar available, um, and I'm more than happy to take any questions if people want to email them to me. So uh, thank you very much for your time today. Great. Thanks, uh, Andy, and thanks, everyone. Thank you.